right on Main Street. This is not Chinatown. There was a Chinatown in Lillooet, but he goes right up on the Main Street and deals elbow to elbow with the white merchants on Main Street and does extremely well at the same time. Reminds me of the merchant princes of Victoria slightly. That's, a, that's an honorable uh, establishment. Quan Qu Lee. But he isn't the only one that succeeds there. The Chinese also branch into uh, other areas of commerce. And some of them become well-known ranchers. Tong Sing, for instance, across the river, it's called Old Duck as well. And um, he was extremely successful with it, had sections of land, and those bench lands lend themselves to ranching. Mm -hmm. He drove about 2,000 cattle, Mike. I didn't think the Chinese were allowed to own property until uh, 1948, but that's not the case. No, not the case. They were accepted under certain conditions uh, in, in the early part of the century, and some of them even had their own brand. So, and certainly around Lillooet, there was great sympathy for the Chinese in the Lillooet area, which says something to me. Now, many of the miners, Mike, were, they would, they would dwell and, and, and persevere in the gold fields for one, two, or three, or four decades. Now, most of these miners were, were uh, illiterate. They'd come from the environs of Canton, and their, their main goal in life was to leave Gunsan, that is the land of Golden Mountain, That's and get back to China. Yep. And now, here's an example. This 35 cents, Mike, indicates exactly what it cost a guy called Kuang Lai to go back, to take to the boat to China. Now, of course, it cost him more when he, once he got there. But Kuang Lai was a typical Chinese miner on the Fraser River. So he, he didn't think of going back by stagecoach. That would cost too much. What's the cheapest and easiest route? Head down the river. That's what he did. Build himself a raft, a little kind of a, a, a makeshift, make-do tent on the raft, packed all his worldly belongings, including his gold and gold dust, which he had, I, I assume, a significant portion to allow him to retire in absolute luxury in China. And he goes down with a few coins in his pocket, that's all. And he goes down that Fraser River, very treacherous river, one of the great rivers of North America, Mike. And you hear about the most dangerous part, what they assume is the most dangerous part of the Fraser River. Hell's Gate. That's Hell's Gate. Now, that isn't the most dangerous part of the Fraser River, Mike. The most dangerous part of the Fraser River makes Hell's Gate look like a walk. And it really does, because that's just below the mouth, just above, excuse me, the mouth of the Bridge River, a place called Fomwater Fraser and Hoist and various Indian pronunciations of that. You come down that part of the river, Mike, and there is no survival, absolutely no survival at all. No one has, has run that particular section of the river and emerged alive. They all die. And even, even the, 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 the people who run the river now don't run that particular part of the Fraser River. But this guy decided to go down river. He sails right serenely, right through Hell's Gate. Uh, by the way, people who, who watched him come down the river said he was smoking as he came through Hell's Gate rather serenely, not bothering too much about anything. Now, I don't know what he was smoking, but it didn't bother him. And he went right pa down past Yale, right through the big canyon, right down past Yale, down past the Seven Sisters, down past all those islands below, below Fort Hope, and right down past the mouth of the Harrison, all those snags down there, and he finally gets into Westminster. And well, Westminster, it's only about 16 miles from Vancouver, and there's a, a, at that particular time, in the 1890s, the, the, the streetcars came into, into, into being in, in Westminster, and the direct route to Vancouver, so he looks at that raft, takes his belongings off the raft, boots the raft out into the river, Mike, takes the 35 cents out of his pocket, and pays that particular fare to Vancouver. Then he catches the next boat to China. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of, of Quan Loy. Now, Quan Loy, he was, he was one of the miners who left. Yeah. And probably, I would think that probably anywhere from half to three quarters of the Chinese miners left when they'd accumulated enough gold. That and was that, their plan originally. That yeah. was their plan, to return to the mother country. But some of them stayed behind, and some of them did extremely well. For instance, it isn't generally known, Mike, that, that the great discovery just south of Yale, actually, at least, excuse me, south of Lillooet, kind of southwest of Lillooet, is a place called, called Cayuse Creek. And the Chinese miners began to, once the bars of the Fraser began to pan off a little bit, they, mm -hmm. they started to get a little too lean for them. They began searching around for other areas that weren't, that weren't covered by white, white miners. In other words, they weren't already safe. Right. And they came across a little creek called Cayuse Creek. And they began to discover that Cayuse Creek held incredibly coarse gold. And, of course, the rush of Cayuse Creek started in 1886. And the interesting thing, Mike, is when that rush started, almost the entire creek was held by Chinese miners. And this, of course, piqued the, uh, 
the uh, imagination you can imagine a yeah, yeah. Of, of, of the whites, and they said, "Well, hold it now. This is this is very very rich uh, rich ore and uh, rich this creek. Is, this is oh look at he's got some of the and it, is this considered coarse gold? Yeah, that's fairly coarse. Now yeah. actually, some of the nuggets on on Cayuche were up to half an ounce 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 and a half. So it was very coarse, but typical the, the gold generally speaking was about this size mike yeah and uh, this means that this gold has to come from somewhere it comes from those quartz stringers somewhere on the upper reaches of mm -hmm. cayuse creek so some of the the local load miners and we talked about and i talked about i alluded to several of the families and one of the families was the noel family n-o-e-l mm -hmm. and if you'll reach that rifle behind you mike we used this in one other program some years ago oh, that's right and we wondered what the uh, what right. the reason for the name stamped on the butt was. That's right. This name actually stamped on the butt is A. A. Noel, Arthur Noel, N. O. E. L. Now that's very interesting because Arthur Noel was the guy who really traced the mother load of the gold coming into into Cayuse Creek, and he he began to prospect very thoroughly with several of his friends all that that precipitous country beyond beyond the, the headwaters of, uh, and, and towards the headwaters of Cayuse Creek, and he came across a, a spectacular run of ore, Mike, which was really unbelievable. This is, what this is what they're looking for. Instead of those little nuggets, they want to find gold in place. And here is gold right in the quartz. Yeah, this, this, this particular piece of quartz, Mike, runs about, t uh, today's price is around $10,000 a ton. And that's free gold, right in the quartz. Sometimes gold is not, is not visible. This is free gold. This is the kind of ore that a prospector wants to see. This is the kind of ore that says, my heaven, this is what I've been looking for all my life. So is this, did Noel go slightly crazy when oh. he discovered this? This and was... Any miner is, is never <laughs> unaffected by it. They're just, it just doesn't happen that way because the miners are a, t uh, are a different breed. So he, he discovers a seam of this, or, or a ledge of this, or a stringer of this, mm -hmm. and of course it's, it's seated in quartz, and he stakes it and he calls it the golden cache. And the golden cache was one of these areas that was very, very difficult to mine, very difficult to get into, and this particular photograph indicates that the kind of conditions that surround the golden cache. And here you have uh, the actual line in there, and you can see the cliff overhanging. Mm -hmm. And it was really, uh, uh, on the nature of it, on the initial discovery, you would think that the golden cache would be equivalent to the Bray Lorne of the Pioneer. But you know, Mike, mining is a strange business. Sometimes the, the showings on the surface will be absolutely unbelievable. The showings certainly on the golden cache were better than Bray Lorne or Pioneer initially, but they didn't seem to go to depth, and they seemed to be too widely separated. So there wasn't a continuous run of that of that very, very high-grade ore. Although the Noel family stayed with it for almost 40 years, selling it, buying back, moving back in there, always hoping that this would be the rainbow. Yeah. Never was the case. Was it enough to have deposited the, the uh, coarse gold in the creek? Uh, was this, in fact, the mother lode that deposited <laughs> that plaster gold in the creek? Or I guess this is what drove Noel on. Now, oh, it had to be bigger than that because there was more that's plastic right. gold. That's right. And then we don't know whether it wiped out all that, all that, or, you know, the, the r initial amount of ore that sometimes when a, when a creek mines plaster gold, Mike, it really mines most of the body of ore and most of that goes down into the creek. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that ore crops up in the creek bottom. I found it in that particular case. And this whole area is, is shot through with all sorts of, uh, uh, of stories. For instance, that basket, Mike, which is right there. And this is, this is, this is one of the artifacts that I, from my, my collection. And this originally belonged to an Indian called Chief Sam Mitchell. And Chief Sam Mitchell, and I knew him about, I would say, 15 years ago, Mike, maybe 20 years ago. And he was, he was an old, old man then. And he was chief of the fountain band. Now, if you know that Lillooet area, Mike, that is one of the most intriguing parts of that particular country as well. And I, I purchased this off him and some other some other uh, Indian artifacts and some other things that he, that he, he was willing to, you know, part with because he knew I would keep it. And, um, and he told me several stories of that particular area, Mike. And one of the stories was about the Lost Pavilion Mine. And this particular area is absolutely fascinating because when you look down, when you look down from, from the pavilion, down into the Fraser Canyon, and you're looking s almost straight down, and you can see the old workings where the miners used to work in there, but this is 500 feet above the canyon, above the, the, the river, river itself. It's just absolutely astonishing. And there's a tremendous run of plaster gold 500 or 600 feet above the canyon wall. So 
Do I still is? Do you think there still is? It came from somewhere, Mike. It's a high run that came from somewhere, probably across the river, probably to the northwest. Take along your trapeze if you want to work that area. For sure. Pretty difficult stuff. Yeah. And Lillooet to this day is off the beaten track, but if we go back at this, if we were to go back right now, we yeah. would find the benches, we would find the river, we sure. would find all of the components that kept people there even after it was no longer going to be the center. Oh, yeah, sure. You Even now, you'll see the old hanging tree is still there, and you'll see the old Indian churches are still intact. Really a marvelous area, mar amazing ambience, Mike. So unlike other communities, which uh, when things didn't pan out, they were abandoned, Lillooet continued to survive and continues to this day. We'll join you next time on Gold Trail.